Uh, great. Uh, 101 registrations. Mm. So now it's the dice of the universe to decide how many <laughs> <laughs> are going to be here. Uh, but we'll get this recording out anyway. So, um, but we got people here, David. So why don't you talk a little bit more about your work? Why don't, why don't we make the most of this time? Um, if people want to put their cameras on, by the way, it's not it's not a webinar in the sense of us and you. You know, we are all here together. We're, we're one team. We're all learning together. There's no divide. So, Pele, Irvin, Robert, if you want to put cameras on, mics on. Hello. Will I crack on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, my, my background is, uh, my name is David Syme, my background is in a combination of emerging technology and further education. So I've been working in digital communications for the last 23 years, uh, moving from text-based communication into more visual-based communication as the internet got faster and there were more options and people's attention spans went down to uh, to then video-based communications as that trend continued. So if a picture speaks a thousand words, a video speaks a million. And, uh, and then as I had an original background in marketing which is predominantly about trend analysis what happened in the past and then next and then next so therefore what can we predict for the future it struck me that it was highly likely that the next paradigm shift in the communication particularly digital communication would be immersive so i started getting involved in virtual and augmented reality that necessitated me learning about uh high-speed connectivity and various other forms of technology but I also then uh, qualified as a lecturer and spent a lot of time as a further education lecturer um, learning really what it was like what the challenges were of being that and it was probably the hardest <laughs> period of my life and I, I then got picked up by the Chartered Institute of Marketing to deliver content on that and the modern apprenticeship scheme and, uh, and Google so now I kind of educate on that and then try to apply the new technologies to the further education sector with a kind of a foot in both camps so that's me. Wonderful thank you so much for being here we're going to be hearing more from you later on and um yeah uh, welcome georgina hi sorry did you hear me say i'm coming in <laughs> i didn't realize i was unmuted because i didn't mean to talk over you david sorry no no i didn't you know don't worry. i don't think we did hear that it's a shame Good. actually it's a yeah. bit of a battle cry isn't it you know <laughs> a little bit i'm going in i was like i've got i'm sat in an office with someone else today. i was like Shh, be quiet <laughs> <laughs> Yes, wonderful. Um, uh, Pele, where are you joining us from? Are you uh, London or somewhere else? Yes, I'm in London. I'm from a college in London. Good morning, every good afternoon. Sorry, everyone. Uh, my name is Pele and I'm Director of Curriculum in the Further Ed Education College, Newham College. And I manage a wide portfolio and including in my portfolio is the digital. Um, so I manage the digital area. Uh, we offer level one to level three courses and we will be starting HTQs next September. Wow, okay. Do you know Kurt or know of Kurt? Sorry? Do you know Kurt or of, do you know of him? No. Okay, no, you no. haven't crossed paths then. No. We've ever met. no, I mean, it's a no. pretty small um, sector all up, but you know, we're meeting people all the time. So no, I don't think we've ever met. No. We've but it's good to meet you today, Kurt. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Nice I suppose you are in a densely populated area, aren't you? It's not like uh, <laughs> you're both from the same small town, so mm -hmm. yeah, fair enough. It is a bit, you know, every time there's another Kiwi accent, the uh, people ask, oh, do you know that person? <laughs> same, sort of, same, same principle, isn't it? <laughs> Wonderful, Patty. What, what brings you here today? Um, I think I saw this invite on LinkedIn. Oh, okay. And as I am, um, every, you know, there's so much reform going in education and it is such a fast pace and I just want to be in the know as a manager and responsible for digital. Um, there's just so much things happening in digital and I want to be at the forefront so that I can direct my team and also ensure my students are prepared for the jobs of the future. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. Whatever they may or may not be. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> crystal ball time. <laughs> yes, crystal ball time, big time. 
Yeah, no, that's yeah. so exciting. Uh, so the idea of these, this is the first one is, um, and actually I'll share a link in a minute, is we'll do these quarterly briefings, bringing in different experts and different peers and, and colleagues of, of your own from the industry as well, to make sure that we are staying focused and connected on the opportunities to do more with emerging technologies, which are critical for the jobs of the future, no matter how we look at it. So I'll put a link out to the next one in just a minute so that we can all put it in our diaries once a few more arrive. We are still, uh, we're early at the moment, so this is a great start to the session and uh, uh david and i are, are creating slash delivering a, a end-to-end solution in terms of hardware consultancy training facilitation uh, extends to uh, empowering the students to um, you know uh, working with college teams uh, lecturers digital experts principal ceos uh, internal upskilling and so on and of course most significantly out into the business community but you won't hear much about that today. We will love to hear from people and we love to have those conversations. But today is all about uh, informing and, uh, and discussing. And uh, we'll, we'll mention that in the background as something that obviously we're keen to, to pick up and discuss. Um, and we'll be hearing from some of the people that we've worked with today. But definitely not a marketing <laughs> seminar. This is the opposite. We just want to be here and learn together. Uh, so welcome new joiners, Graham, uh, Liz. Uh, I'll have to check my little sheet for M. W. Johnson to see what your first name is. <laughs> Unless you want, I'm welcome, I got you as well. Unless you want to save me the <laughs> effort. Welcome, Monica. Thank you. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. Good. Yeah. Good. Where, where are you, um, darling, in from? Um, presently, I'm in the US, but I'm from Nigeria. Oh, ah, yeah. okay. Great. N nice and early then, I should think. Yeah, it's still morning, so that's why my video is not on. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I joined an early call with the team, and somebody said, Richard, you look terrible. And how is that encouraging me to do early meetings? I don't enjoy anyway. Um... I'm a university lecturer in the University of Port Harcourt, but I came here to do research in University of Michigan, but I'm interested in AI, anything AI, and there is one of the emerging technologies that's not everywhere, so I'm interested in this conversation. We love a bit of AI. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, I just came off a call with uh, an AI company in America and they had their cameras off because they were on straight. It was like 6 a.m. where they were at. But we were talking, we were talking about the application of artificial intelligence to further education. That was what they called it. So uh, there's certainly some stuff that we can do. Yeah, make sure you follow David Sam on LinkedIn, by the way. His posts are amazing. <laughs> oh, and uh, they, they, he's, he's a bit of a LinkedIn celebrity. <laughs> Honestly, he goes viral. He gets thousands sometimes of likes, and uh, it's not something that the secret source hasn't rubbed off on me, unfortunately. <laughs> With my seven likes on a post that took me two hours. <laughs> uh, George, welcome. Hi, yeah, well. welcome. Good, thank you. Good. Whereabouts are you? Farnborough College of Technology. Farnborough. Do you know anybody on the call so far? Uh, no, just uh, actually, I, I recognize Mr. Hintz. Do you? Because uh, he, he interviewed me at a college 13 years ago. And then before I could join, he left to go to bigger positions in London. I'm, I'm sure the offer was about to come in, by the way, George. I'm sure. <laughs> Not because of me, no. <laughs> Do you remember that, Gert, or too long ago? Nice to meet you, George. Yes, I remember. Good. Do you? Yes, I remember every interview. And there's been thousands, I'm sure, over the years, but um, yeah. <laughs> Hi, George. Not too many South African ones. <laughs> well, there we go. We found a connection. Welcome, Mike. Welcome, Graham. I don't think I welcomed Graham yet. If I did, it uh, doesn't hurt to do it twice. Great. We're, we're three minutes to the hour. Uh, so I hope you're probably getting the idea now. Very light session this um we you know we've got all cameras on where possible you're very very welcome to turn your camera on we very much just want to be in the shared space together 
looking to do these quarterly. I'll pop a link out in a little bit for the January session as well. Um, obviously, you know, these things move so quickly. Um, and, um, you know, David and I have the enviable and unenviable task of being generous, really, in this market that takes us into fascinating technologies, virtual realities, metaverse augmented realities, um, haptic suits for feedback and uh, virtual analytics around artificial intelligence and blockchain and tokenomics. And uh, uh, it's, <laughs> I don't know how your cognitive capacity is, David, but it hurts my brain. <laughs> I particularly like waking up every morning and I'm no longer the expert because everything's changed again. You know, it keeps you on your toes. I think uh, there's there's absolutely no chance of stagnating in this industry because it's just this constant flood of information. But I love that. It keeps you young. I know. One well, of the fascinating absolutely. things this week was, I mean, I've long said that self-driving cars are not fit for purpose. And finally, some more press has come out this week that $100 billion has gone into this um, technology and it's failing. I mean, it's it's not happening. Mm. Um, there's the the long tail of events that mean that you know these are these are human interactions, and uh, it's fascinating to see the, the the harsh debate where you know just belief and money aren't enough in these technologies sometimes to to cross the chasm. Um, so welcome Mark, welcome Graham, welcome Zoe. Uh, Eighteen of us so far. That's wonderful. A few more on the way, I'm sure. Uh, but we will start and finish on time and we'll catch those up who uh, arrive a few minutes after we are recording. So hi, Jamie. Uh, connecting to audio, probably didn't hear me say that. So um, there we go. Welcome, Jamie. Good. So uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, planning to do these once a quarter. Um, in fact, we, we will. Um, we'll be navigating the high seas of the emerging technologies. Phil, a very warm welcome to you. And uh, we've brought in um, three uh, speakers today, myself kind of moderating and hosting. Uh, and those are Kurt, if you can give us a wave, we'll introduce you in a moment. Uh, Georgina, uh, David Syme. Uh, <laughs> David refused to wave. <laughs> we'd never get you on a celebrity quiz show, would we, David? We have to wave at the camera for minutes on end. Uh, so welcome, Tony, as well. From uh, De Seva and uh, Chris, great to see you again. Uh, put cameras on if you like. We're uh, we're all uh, one group here, so please don't don't think that you need to be in the background. Uh, this is a short welcome from me, but I'm going to make as much time available for discussion. Hopefully, there'll be lots to talk about after our speakers have contributed a few thoughts. Um, so we're we're 24. Should we dive in? Great. Okay. Well, this is the um, the first briefing organised by ourselves, MKI. Org, um, to support the sector in um, the transfer of skills and knowledge into the business community via students and whilst empowering those teams that work in this area in the sector. It's a great privilege to be here in your company. Um, we've been working with a few colleges groups so far. It's incredibly exciting. I think there's more scope <laughs> in all of these different areas. Uh, so, Kurt, I wanted to uh, chat with you first a little bit, and um, let's start by, I mean, some of some of you know Kurt, some of you have been interviewed by Kurt, <laughs> um, but get a little bit on your background, if you would, first, and uh, what you're currently doing. Sure. I'm Kurt Hintz. Welcome, everybody. I'm Kurt Hintz. I'm the Executive Principal at the Capital City College Group. Um, you can tell I've got a little accent. It's a Kiwi accent, if, um, if you're guessing, and uh, I came to the UK in 2004. Um, I've been in further education since about 98, I think I first joined mechanical engineers, my background, and uh, I went into further education teaching that area in New Zealand in, uh, in about 98 and sort of quite quickly progressed actually, and I was in a, operating a satellite centre there and came across to the, to the UK um, as a head of school for engineering in about 2004, and sort of then ended up uh, delivering and, and being a head of school within IT and the and as well as the engineering sides of things, and then moved into Cornell, which is College North East London, and sort of um, my career continued in there as vice principal and um, senior manager, and, and then off to the principal of Cornell. We merged into a very large college group in London. You know, we're one of the big ones um, in England now, sort of 30,000 plus students every year, and um, three big colleges, City, Nissington, West, um, Westminster, Kingsway, and Cornell all together, sort of cover a large swathe of the sort of North, East London patron. Um, 
So that's a little bit about me. I, I, you know, I've been involved in, in that curriculum design development activity for, for a very long time. And it's uh, that innovative piece that really energizes me every day, actually. Thank you so much, Kurt. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Welcome to join us as well. I think uh, Nicola, Kirk, Phil, Kate, Sarah, Sue, Liz, uh, you're very, very welcome. Amanda as well. Uh, great to see you here. That's wonderful. Uh, Kurt, what, you know, what, do you, what do you find personally? What, what sort of responsibility do you feel personally in your job for the catalyzation um, of emerging technologies? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's, it, it's this, why do we do this? Why, why what's, what's the sort of reward? What are we trying to achieve by this? And my basic principle is that we're ultimately here as FE colleges to set the standards for industry. And for too long, and, and I see too often actually, a constant rhetoric of colleges are somehow riding the coattails of industry, and we're somehow striving to constantly keep up and be uh, trying to meet their needs and, and therefore just about do enough to get people skilled enough to go into that industry. But actually, FE colleges are far more than that. We were always here and always designed to actually advance technology, advance those skills areas, advance and set the standards for those industries that we work with. And so for me, the innovative piece and this extra activity that we do and the flexibility that we have with our funding regimes is, is really enabling that now. And I must say, it's the first time since I've been in the UK that the flexibilities within the funding regime, and I'll talk a bit about that later, um, have allowed us to be really genuinely um, innovative to the level that I um, expect and would like to be. So great time to be an FE actually. Yeah, most definitely. One of your key focuses is on uh, the green industry and green technologies. Now, I'm sure you and I are not alone in our focus in that area. Um, do you think that's that's pretty standard now for colleges? Or, or, I mean, is that something specifically that you wanted to advance in the area? Well, I think it, it doesn't really matter where you look now, does it? I mean, every piece of information that, and, and booklets that I look at, I mean, of skills needs um, for occupations over the next five to 10 years, all of the, the documents that you see from the GLA, the Greater London Authority on, on the priority areas, everywhere you look, digital is imprinted and the advancement of digital into all of those skills areas. And it genuinely, it doesn't matter where you look. And I think, you know, I'm preaching to the converted here, in every walk of life, this is advancing. And, and it's pretty clear that we need to set that pathway. And if he colleges, we need to set our curriculum up to, to design for the future. Um, and I, I guess it's not every college at the moment who has taken the initiative yet on really utilizing the flexibilities in the funding system to really enable this. Um, and uh, to me, this is all about partnerships. It's not about getting people in our organization who have those skills, knowledge, and expertise, because actually that's not a reality. You can only get so much out of your team, but actually one of the critical pieces for us is bringing in those partners, bringing in those expertise, and then using those to, to demonstrate to industry what really can be done. Yeah, and there's multiple streams here, isn't there? And I know you're focused on, on all of them. There's the, the ability for emerging technologies to produce better learning outcomes. Uh, as is, there's the future of work and future of jobs for your students of which this plays a critical part. And then there's the skills gap in the community organizations who sort of miss the boat, don't they, on emerging technologies. But why do you think they miss it sometimes? Is there a sense of fear or is a lack of access to information? What's on your mind there? Yeah, I would say, I don't think we're as good as we, we should be at, at actually putting this information and in the access in front of students um, in all cases. And I'll give you an example of that. You know, we probably focus too much on qualifications and have done for a long time. And, you know, let's be clear, we've been forced and boxed into this corner. And uh, our ability to innovate through the funding system has been, has been, you know, curtailed pretty heavily over the years. And actually, we've suddenly been let out of the box. And sometimes it's a bit hard for us to get creative when we've been so used to this really stringent regimes. And so we can absolutely use RAPA, we can use notional levels, we can fund all of that and give people the skills at whatever level they are. They don't have to come on a level one IT course or a level one and something rather or get a qualification. We can simply put a package of learning together of 25 odd hours, make it accessible in the evenings of maybe three hours a week for, for say seven or eight weeks 
and give people a really good introduction to a subject matter without having to be boxed into a qualification, bringing in the expertise. You know, we've done this with, with you and your team. Um, where we're absolutely given that flexibility and, and really dialed it up around uh, what we're able to offer to people and the access we can grant them without, like I say, having to be boxed into a, a qualification outcome. Yeah, I must applaud that as well. You've given us so much flexibility and freedom to really orientate that at people's careers and businesses. And we've brought guest speakers in from industry in the last Metaverse course, we had you know folks from EY come in and, and other large organizations uh, and startups as well, because we're following your lead. We actually just want to catalyze and inspire and create a really good discourse and discussion that you know will affect somebody's work tomorrow and next month. And you know, it's so fast, isn't it? This industry. Sure. Okay. Do you want to talk a little more about the funding that you are leveraging and accessing? Maybe some people. Yeah, no, indeed. And, and and so anybody else who's who's for the further education, I know there was many. So I thought I did want to just just go into that a little bit today because we're using we're in the Greater London Authority and uh, we have a devolved adult education budget. Um, I know some of this will be a little bit double dutch to, to people on the call but for those who understand this ultimately we were given 10% uh, flexibility in that funding so the total funding that we umbrella that we get we're able to use 10% of that money in a very very flexible innovative way. Um, it's based on the they called it the London Recovery um, flexibilities. However, it's actually going to continue into the future if we use it well. This gives us total autonomy for what we design, and then we can deliver the program at whatever cost it is, the same way as community funding works. Whatever it costs, it costs. The basic principle is value for money rather than a total amount of money per student. So we can put a program of learning together, use RAPA, which is a, a process of recognizing and recording um, of progress and achievement. So, so that's the setting out some, some basic goals for that learning program and then delivering it in the number of hours we want to with the skills and expertise that we might draw in from industry or anywhere to do that delivery. Um, and it's fully funded. Now, that's a, that's a great way of doing any sort of innovative work and really uh, stretching the envelope, I suppose, on innovation and activity and new technologies where there isn't a qualification, where there isn't anything. And of course, that it can be um, any notional level. It's not locked to level one, level two, or anything else. It's completely open to whatever we need it to be, um, whatever the needs of industry might be. And I guess um, one of the things that... that I think our role is when I talked about setting the standards for industry, often employers, um, especially small to mediums, don't know what they don't know. And by bringing this in and spiking a bit of interest, you can bring them in and they can learn some technology and then think about how they might apply it to their business or their circumstance or their situation. I then offer them opportunities to advance and do further qualifications or skills. You know, and what we've done, we have, you know, literally hundreds of these types of courses now running. Um, about 46, 47% of everybody that does them advances onto something bigger as a result. So it's an absolute mechanism to get people involved in, in both getting formal and further qualifications but also uh, developing themselves. Um, also, if you're not in the Greater London Authority, the, the out education budget more widely in the UK for, for the ESFA or the non-devolved areas equally has that flexibility in it. So they're called the local flexibilities. It is a bit more locked down. It's up to notional level two and things like that. But you can easily use that exact mechanism to fund uh, the, this type of training in a very similar way. So, so there are you know, absolute mechanisms there. The ESFA, the new accountability framework um, consultation that just literally closed, I think it's closing today on Wednesday, tonight, it has a specific component, 3%, I think, of the funding for adults of which they uh, are proposing is used in this very, very flexible way in the same way that the Greater London Authority have given. So I know it's a bit complex, I suppose, for those who aren't involved, but for those who are, is absolutely the way you can fund and deliver this innovative work. So uh, there you go. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. I mean, I know we have a bit of an international audience here. We've heard that already, but, but UK folks, mm -hmm. um, you know, how many of you could, could leverage that? How much is that useful? Um, put in the chat maybe, or uh, put this um, thumbs up or something like this. But um, it'd be good to know where a little bit more information would be helpful about that. So do uh, contact me. Yes, yeah, Sue, yeah, it's one for you possibly, is it? 
Yes, we're with the uh, West Midlands Combined Authority, so we already have the flex in place. Um, so I, I'm just really interested to, to sort of listen to the fact that, you know, talking to industry, listening to their needs or, or actually showing them what they may not know as well. I, I think that's a, 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 a good way to approach it that we probably hadn't thought about. I think a lot of ours is linked to, to qualifications. It's very much qualification led. So it's looking at it in a different way, which is interesting. Yes. Great. Well, that's good to know, Sue. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so what we've got, Kurt, here, so, so questions for Kurt or, or suggestions or, or thoughts or ideas. Um, this is uh, an open session. You're very, very welcome to put your camera on. Many people have, which is wonderful. Um, if you're you know, able to switch it on, it'd be great to see some more uh, faces on the screen. Um, I want to bring Georgina into the conversation, and Kurt, this might be one for, for both of you, but what do you see as the FE College's opportunity or, or gap that the universities don't currently fulfil when it comes to skills? Well, I think Kurt is possibly better to answer that than, than I am. Yeah, sure thing. I mean, I'll try not to offend any HE um, <laughs> colleagues that are on the call when I say this, but hey, look, you know, many would say that the FE colleges are, are barges that, that are slow to turn. I would say the complete opposite. We're speedboats. We can turn on a dime and we can absolutely demonstrate that, you know, from our being able to create a course, come up with subject matter, get feedback from an employer, turn around and put a course on and have it out to market. Total time for that. We can do it in two weeks. We can also do it in three months if we really want to put a lot of detail into it, but we literally can turn it around that quickly. We put it out to market, put a big booking system in uh, and have students booking on that course within a couple of weeks. You know, that's the level of ability that the FE sector has. It's got this full funding flexibility, which is funded by government that I've mentioned, but universities just don't have access to generally. Um, they have to uh, really spend a lot of time creating, if you like, micro-credentials, which are small packages of learning, which maybe in the future will be, will be funded through loans, but ultimately it's full cost. So the majority of their work is at cost to the end user. Um, ours is effectively free, and we can make it free. In fact, we commit to that, to every single adult that comes to say, it is free, you don't even have to ask, it's free. We take the funding of which we can get for individuals, and that's our, you know, an absolute, um, important feature of what we deliver so we we are in a unique position as as opposed to universities i think in this space yes uh, amanda i see, see your camera on i mean you're you're very active in this space as well and uh, you you work with georgina as well and are planning more in this area does that resonate in terms of that speed to be able to deploy things yeah, I think so. I mean, in many ways, the speed is imposed on us because the DFE like to do things with quite a quick flash to bang time. Um, but, you know, if you make the if you do the planning properly, you can buy yourself quite a lot of freedom of manoeuvre. Once you put in a bid and you've got the money, there's actually um, more flexibility than people might think to, to get stuff off the ground. Yes, and you're on a, a hardware and uh, delivery journey right now, aren't you, at, at some high pace? <laughs> yeah, <indeed. laughs> You're good to chat a little more about that in this session, things that you, you can share. Uh, Georgina, you've muted yourself again, but but <laughs> do come off mute. Just the conscious of sort of background um, noise a little bit. I mean, I think it what sort of what Kurt's just said is about us being able to turn around and 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 evolve um something. Milton Keynes College were incredibly fortunate to be recipients of additional funding through the strategic development fund that did exactly that listened to our local employers understood what the skills gap were and we did it from a digital point of view and a leadership and management point of view and therefore created a series of very short courses um, that we were able to deliver for free to our local um, employers and their employees it was limited in terms of the time frames which Amanda sort of just alluded to in terms of quick turnarounds etc and we made use of that resource to allow us to offer it for free as much as we have been able to um, 
but all funding has a limit it's, it's it, in some way and that's certainly what we found with with the funding pot that we had so we have been in a position to think about how do we continue to make use of this um new curriculum that we've developed and how can we continue to deliver that to our local um employers and one interesting area of debate and challenge uh, was around the training needs assessment uh, when it came to emerging technologies and that that can be quite difficult kind of to understand what the needs are in an yeah. area that most people don't quite know how to navigate yet what were your some of your yeah. learning outcomes from that well I think the fundamental learning was that our local employers don't know what they don't know and so where we'd produced a very sort of static form for people to complete and score themselves on a on a you know a one to four or whatever the metric was and ask them to complete some uh, some bits we actually found real value in having the conversations with them um to open up what they don't know to then identify what they need to know and that's the biggest part of the the kind of learning that we've seen in that in that sort of collaborative um working is that if you can open a dialogue and you can have you know that active listening you bring all the people that are different together you're going to then succeed because you're listening and you're able to produce something that's actually really required and I think sort of you know Kurt touched upon that of having the things that are there available um and you know you have to bring in partners and we've had to bring in external expertise to allow us to do that but what the real benefit that we've had is that we've learned along the way as well. So now we have some of that knowledge internally, which is fantastic. And that's allowing us to then cascade that through to the rest of our staff. And we're evolving our curriculum, making use of the AI kit the, the, that we've been successful um, in acquiring. Um, and we, it, it started by working with a wider team, um, you know, recognising your gaps and then filling them but it takes time. Yes. <clears throat> and you're not too long out of industry, are you, into this? No. So I, I've been at the college for three years in my, in my role here. And previously I worked in um, the private sector within um, sort of data. Um, so I'm no, no AI expert, but this project certainly felt um, like really kind of comfortable um, for me in terms of what we were doing from that um AI piece that that kit capital element um, of it and it's FE's really sort of been quite different and I, and I, I'm, I don't I'm, I can't broad brush it and say that it's everywhere but there have been pockets of silos which have closed really quickly when you get the right people in the room to then be collaborative and if you can do that if you can manage to get the the right people around the table at the same time then you can move, like you say, very quickly. And do you have an example of that where maybe there was some concerns or fears or lack of understanding and how you well, were able to move this, together? I mean, this project abso absolutely is it. So we Want to built describe a bid. the project just a little bit more as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so we did a bid back in July, August of last year, and there were three or four of us around the table. And we said, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could um, do some work on our college business centre? So we've done some capital building and work and then do some work with our local employers, you know, align to the LSITs, which are coming, you know, make sure that we are in a position to be able to answer the how that that change in process is coming. And there were four or five of us, as I say, that sat down and we we asked for all this money and then we were successful. I went, oh, OK, um, very short period of time in which to do that. and. Uh, you know, we'd wait, we'd made wild assumptions as to what kit we would purchase or the time frame that we would make um, uh, the refurbishment to um, to a um, an area of the college in terms of bricks and mortar. So upon being granted the money, we had to bring those people in that it's going to affect from that kind of day to day. And the, the the joys of funding and my experience over the last couple of years is that something gets announced on Monday and you've only really got until Tuesday to, to make an application. So it's, it's incredibly difficult to bring everybody in when you're making that funding application because sometimes you just need to get it done. So I think there's a bit of a lesson learned there in that the, the sooner you bring in your head of IT, for example, <laughs> uh, or your estates director, so that they know what you've asked for 
then they might help they might be able to help you um better when the money suddenly appears and you've got to you know build a college business center and be in receipt of all of this kit that not many people know what we're going to how you're going to do that and how you're going to you make use of that kit yeah and, and david you were instrumental in helping the college to select that kit so regina david you know how did you plan so that you know, there wouldn't be all this technology going obsolete or gathering dust uh, yeah i mean that was difficult. our biggest that was our biggest request with with david was can we make sure that what we procure we can make use of very quickly so it's proven technology that we can use in curriculum delivery and that we wouldn't get it wouldn't get stuck on a shelf you know gathering dust that was one of the requirements and the other one that was going to be sort of easily cascaded in terms of knowledge and you know the tesla suits are fantastic there's one creeping at me looking at me with a vr headset on because we bought a mannequin and it's sitting in the corner and it gets me every time i come into the college business center because it's kind of there like that um but the amount of use we've had that with our with our students and they have the ability to um gather the data from wearing the the, the suit and you know they've got the the headset on at the same time it was very much usable technology that wouldn't be defunct in 12 months that was our criteria that's right isn't it david and then I mean, you david, went that, well, that tesla suit's cutting edge isn't it i mean if you want to say a bit more about it yeah yeah absolutely i mean uh, yeah kind of my job's always been to look at this technology and, and vet it and make sure that it's good for a start and then work out from there what purposes it might be suited to uh, excuse the pun in this case uh, so given my kind of background in further education every piece of technology that i that i work with i go oh okay that could be used to train this i mean the tesla suit is a great example because it takes uh, your biometric readings it can tell your heart rate it can tell your body temperature it can tell your position really accurately so that can be used for everything from physiotherapy training to uh, sports training to probably a whole bunch of other things and so when I started working with Georgina and the college, the first step was to look at the curriculum, to look at the local businesses around there that the already, there was already information for, and go, okay, what could what would be useful to deliver to them? What would be useful for the college to deliver to them? What kind of curriculum changes would be required within the college for that? And then and only then, what technology would bridge that gap or facilitate that? And that, that technology should always come last. Everything else is the, is the primary consideration. Does it create jobs? Does it help the lecturers? Is it suitable for the colleges or is it too complicated to use or deliver? And I would say that the Tesla suit is on the edge of, it's quite a complicated one to use and to deliver. So it's really good to hear that you're getting such good use out of it. Because uh, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, yeah, yeah. And we're, in, we're incredibly fortunate to also be working with Amanda over at West Hearts as part of a second round of, of, of mm. that. Um, and we've had really good conversations, I think, about our experiences of the equipment that we've received first time around that has then contributed to the decisions that we've made the second time around. So again, it's that conversation, it's that listening that says, actually, here's our experience. We can transfer that knowledge on. Let's learn from it. And then let's make sure that we continue to evolve so that we're always delivering the best for the students because we're using it for our curriculum delivery. But we are also using it with our local employers. And the intention is for this business centre to be here as a local employer, you know, an SME who, who would like to make use of that Tesla suit, but just doesn't have the funds to go and acquire them because they're not cheap bits of kit, but they can come in and they can make use of that in our business center so that they can then have a go they can actually do what they want to do within their organization with access to a piece of kit that's available kind of further and wider and i know it's not your modus operandus but that kit has left the center as well i know that we've been benefiting from borrowing some of that technology um, and one of them was the whole lens too from microsoft um, david you tell this story so well could you describe the the, the project that uh, MK College did with Danica, uh, where, where they, they took a mixed reality device and, and leveraged the college, because that's a great example of this, isn't it? That's yes, because that's kind of the next step is the, 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 the businesses actually then interacting with the colleges in two ways, because they need to know not only that they can access that technology, as Georgina said, to test it themselves at lower cost, but also that come graduation day, there's going to be a lot of highly trained 
people that are capable of operating that technology. And that's 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 just as big a resource as the technology itself. It gives them the confidence of using it. Now, in terms of the actual applications in local businesses, even whilst it remains within or out with the technology, Hubdeneca had an issue where what they do is they create batteries for um, electrical vehicles. They're even getting into uh, aerial electrical vehicles. So uh, you really need to make absolutely sure that these batteries do not fail <laughs> because you don't want <laughs> the battery falling out when you're 50,000 feet in the sky. Um, so what they do at the moment is that there's there's over a thousand screws, quite simply, that, that, that hold the batteries together. And they all have to be tightened up to exactly the right torques and tolerances to make sure that they're not too tight uh, and making the thing brittle or they're not too loose and they'll shake themselves out of alignment. This is done manually. So that's a lot of work, but it has to be done very accurately. So how it was previously done was the operator would use a, a, a smart a smart screwdriver effectively, which would gauge the torque. They would go look at a machine, go, right, that's fine, that's gone into the right level, and then they would go back to the battery. Imagine doing that a thousand times per battery. That's a lot of time. So all they were looking for was a means of reducing the time that that would take. Now, the HoloLens, too, is an augmented reality headset. So as you're wearing it, it gives you effectively a heads-up display, digital display. And all that we did was we uh, kindly, uh, the college lent us that technology. We got a third party operator to uh, hook it in to the, to the smart drills and the, the, the smart technology, which would uh, work at the talking. And as they were using it, it would just say, you're fine, you can move on to the next one. And just not having to look up at a computer for every one of those hundreds or thousands of screws has dramatically reduced the amount of time it takes for them to put these batteries out. It's increased the safety rate. It's reduced the failure rate because if something goes wrong with one of these things, they get binned. Now that's terribly bad for the environment because these are you know, nickel mirror hydrate batteries or lithium ion batteries, but also it's a hugely wasteful and it increases costs. So that right there has connected the college with the with the business, with the clients, and made a, a triple win relationship between all of them, and they immediately said, "We want to we want to work." Well, they, they they said they wouldn't do this. They wouldn't, but they had no budget to do this particular project. Uh, so we stepped in with the equipment, with the consultancy, and now they will uh, buy the kit and they will we we'll launch on this basis. Um, it, it was an incredible example of a college filling that gap where, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was just slightly out of reach for them. And now they see the college as being the subject matter expert. Yeah. And that's who they would go back to. And that's, that's you know, usually it's universities that manage to get that, that pride of place because they've got the additional funds and budgets to be able to focus on that. Colleges are usually too busy educating people, you know. This is this is a great way of not taking too much time resource away from the college, but yeah. actually creating that connection with business. Yeah, absolutely right. And the de-risking it. I mean, just to come back to those Tesla suits and then, Kurt, I want to ask you just about drones in a second as well and, and some of your plans. Um, but I mean, I love the I love all these examples that you give me with this area. But the, the one with the Tesla suit I loved is that um, you, know, you could employ somebody to work on a crane right up in the air for the first time. And, and you know, they might convince you or you might be convinced that they will tolerate that stressful environment. Well, with the Tesla suit we, and VR, we can find out. We can absolutely be certain whether or not and how their body will respond and so on, and whether they're equipped uh, before they go up there, uh, avoiding potential you know, hazards or dangers or risks or, or cost or whatever. So you know, as part of your interview process, come down to the college, put the suit on, test it, and save yourself uh, all sorts of hiring costs, right? And there's one example, I mean, hundreds of these, right? <laughs> Yeah, usually you only find out that you're your person that you've spent a lot of money recruiting and training and getting their tickets. You only find out that they've got vertigo once you put them up a ladder, which is usually way right at the end of that. That's not the time to find out. <laughs> yeah. And actually, we're doing some work with uh, KFAR in uh, Portsmouth, I believe. They, they've got something like a, a I believe it's a 30, no, sorry, it's it's only a 35% retention rate. They lose 65% of their uh, their new people through things like claustrophobia and vertigo on day one. Wow. That's a, and we're talking hundreds per week, right? That is a vast expense wow. that they could save by being able to identify this person is not fit for this. They are terrified of small spaces or, or working eyes right from the outset. People can pretend, they can pretend really well, but you can't pretend away from a suit which knows that your heart's beating faster or that you're sweating more and that you're, you know, your galvanic response is all increased. You know, you cannot fake that. Yeah, and that's simple machine learning, isn't it? To work out what that data says and data says this person's not going to cope well. 
you know, yeah. and you can make you can still you can make your own decisions, whatever you want, but that's what the data will tell you. And you can desensitize them with the very same technology. Oh, well, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots of options. And, and Kurt, you're having these kind of requests uh, around drones, aren't you? And, and aerial work and those kind of things. So this must resonate, I guess. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I, I was really impressed with that one, actually, because, David, that's the point about colleges, where we fit in comparison to universities. We absolutely fit in the middle there, where it's the application of the technology, the application of skills. It's the people who, at level four or five, you would classify as the technical expertise. The big chunk of activity that UK PLC has got missing and is saying that this is the problem with our productivity, the people who we haven't been qualifying and skilling in this area. So absolutely, this is where colleges fit that piece, where they have the people with the skills, expertise that have gone up through the qualifications. And we can then apply those new learning, that new technology to those circumstances. So really pleasing to hear that one. Our, our next one that we're working on, um, you know, with yourselves, of course, is uh, drones and use of drones. And, and, you know, to be honest, Olga thought that was just for kids at home until recently. Um, and of course, it's the application, isn't it, of people seeing this technology and saying, ah, I think I want to use it for X or Y. Now, our example is an employer that we're working with that they do green roofs. They call them green blue roofs, which are, uh, it's a company, it's Polypipe actually, and their background is exactly as it is, piping that you use in plumbing systems and other things. But their technology has moved on into actually the, the green roofs that you see on the tops of buildings is where their development's headed. And of course, with the sustainability and the green agenda, absolutely the carbon capture and all of the things that they prevent um, water going into the sewer systems, all those sorts of things. And actually, they came to us only a couple of months ago and said, you know what, we really need the younger people to be able to use the drone technology because that's what we use for the initial survey. And that's what we need to be able to do as part of this uh, activity. And of course, prior to that, what they needed was plumbers and plumbers that could do the plumbing up of this stuff, but actually this is developing and it's just another example of technology emanating into everything we do into all areas. So there we go, we're developing that drone program for that uh, that part of the sector, that part of the industry and uh, hope to have that up and running fairly shortly. So that's that's another example, isn't it, of, of this application and where we need to go. Yeah. I'm on the same page, Kurt. It wasn't that long ago that I thought drones were just cool for taking aerial photos, but <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point that you raised there, Kurt. And there's so many industrial applications and so many uh, right outside of industrial applications which are job creators, uh, working at heights, painting at heights, uh, inspections in hazardous areas, high voltage areas, sewers, mines, uh, you know, explosive environments, but also, and that that's, a really, really good skill, but it requires a lot of like CAA pilot license level qualification and a lot of instruction around the specific requirements around these different environments. But then you take out to things like uh, the media landscape where there's a lot more filming being done in the UK now. And there's a lot more kind of micro studio work being done, which is creating work. And now you don't need to hire a helicopter, you can hire a drone operator. And that, hel that uh, drone can be used for all sorts of different media applications from photography to videography to 3D modeling for creating digital twins, all sorts of things. And that, so there's lots and lots of jobs in and around just that one piece of technology of drones. And in terms of job creation, this is a question for everybody, really, that you know, we've spoken to, including everybody who's very welcome to join this conversation, by the way. <laughs> like, um, is it, you know, what, what potential is there for job creation for an 18 year old in, in one of your colleges to say, I actually want to start my business here in the college business center. And you know, I've just heard about 65% of these companies, you know, uh, employees leave because they weren't, you know, ready for the role that they've been employed to. So I'm going to set a business up based on that. And I'm going to invite those companies to come down and, and use the equipment that I'm going to borrow every day from the college because I'm here on site. And that's going to be my business or my drones business is going to be based here or my remote surveillance company is going to be based here to help, you know, people on oil rigs to diagnose issues using the HoloLens 2 that, you know, that we've got here in the college. I mean, is that feasible or am I going out on a, a wing and a prayer here? <laughs> so you're breaking up a little yeah, bit there. I just, I just saw that message. But yeah, so, you know, how likely could a student be to set up their business in a college center like this, using that equipment as their first step into entrepreneurialism? You know what, um, if I just jump in, Richard, we, we actually have that exact program. So it's called Visionaires. 
And uh, it's uh, actually a multitude of colleges have joined in and it's entrepreneurship. And it's exactly that, the, the giving people the entrepreneurial skills to start their own business. And exactly as you say, using all of the facilities within a college and elsewhere in order to do that. There's uh, seed funding available, all sorts of things, all linked to programs like that. And I think probably most colleges have a type of entrepreneurial type program, but yes, absolutely. That's a great example. And I, I really liked uh, the example earlier of what you're doing is I, I would always hope that we're giving people students skills of which they can take back to that workplace. Uh, and they're, you know, a young person will be, maybe they're an apprentice, has got skills which they're taking back to their business, which no one in that organization has. And the employer's really, really rapt to say, oh my gosh, you understand this technology. Can you now teach the rest of us or bring it into my business? And, uh, you know, that's what we're really here for. And I think that when I hear those stories, they are exactly what colleges were always meant to be. And it's great to see us uh, emerging in that space yet again. Yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly what we've been doing with um, with some of the workshops that we've been putting in place with this kit. And actually, we um, brought in our apprentices in our um, construction and sort of um, greener technologies. They were taught how to use the drones and then they were part of the delivery of the workshop to our employers. So they learned something new. They got the ability, the option to teach um, as part of, of that work. And they then took it back into their employers um, with, with the skills that they had. So we were, it's, it's, a, it's a format that, we've, that we're working on. Um, we've got a few more of those um, with MKAI. And we've we, we're really enjoying the outcome and being able to bring our students in so we've done a second one um, and we went to a different school and we asked our 16 to 19s instead of our apprentices um to to be involved in that and the next one that we'll do we'll go to a different school and we'll bring them in um to do it so we're really enjoying and, and it's exciting that we're not just upskilling our staff who will then deliver these workshops but we've, we've had the ability to bring in, you know, our current students and apprentices as well. Yeah, and it is wonderful to see that. Uh, that last workshop that you led around um, digital twins and immersive scanning environments and, and watching some of your students um, teaching those in industry who were looking to develop their businesses. And they weren't just startups. We had uh, senior people from KPMG in that room as well who traveled up from London to be in that session. And, and if you don't mind me saying, um, we, we, uh, we supported training up six students, by the way, ahead, well ahead of time. Uh, they couldn't make the session. So we had six brand new students arrive an hour or two before the session <laughs> who didn't know anything about this. And they picked it up like that. It was just wonderful to see. That's so much smarter than I was <laughs> at age. I'm going to pop this on the screen uh, because um, we're going to have this lively discourse debate and the support for the industry once a quarter. So that is the next session. There'll be um, lots more information going into that. But at this stage, uh, just go back to Eventbrite. Just just register for that now. It's all obviously free, all free, absolutely free. And then that that'll be in your diary for January. Uh, so um, just pop that in again here. Uh, my apologies for uh, any interruptions to my broadcasting. It's slightly frustrating, but I'm not sure why it's happening. Um, uh, David, um, you prepared a few thoughts for today, haven't you? Sorry, Richard, I can hear you there. <laughs> Am I really that bad? <laughs> I'm afraid so. Oh, my God. <laughs> want to switch off your video? Is it? Oh, my word, is it that bad? Okay. So, yeah. okay. So, I was saying you've prepared a few thoughts about the opportunities in our industry, haven't you? Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> so, as far as I can see, and this, this is an issue across the technology industry uh, as well, is that it moves incredibly fast. I used to be involved in marketing, digital marketing, and I used to think of that move fast because every week I had to relearn what I was doing. But in the technology field, and particularly the kind of technology which you can apply to uh, industry and employment, it changes on a daily, hourly, even every minute basis. So it's very hard to keep up with. Therefore, what colleges are good for, as Kurt said earlier on, is being flexible. It can take years to get something into a curriculum in higher education, by which point it's obsolete. And also people can end up looking at things through too narrow a focus to the point where it becomes siloed and less than useful in the practical uh, world. What colleges are really good for is working with the employers, as we've heard from Georgina Ankar, to say, what is it you need? 
what would help you and therefore what can we teach that would help you with that and that's that's really how vocational training should work now i was asked to get involved in a uh, an, an initial tech, this is pre-COVID, just pre-COVID, and it was a, a, a technology hub in uh, Essex. And uh, what I realised I was going to do was apply my marketing background, my trend analysis and market research background to work out what was required in the local industry, and then do a kind of a short, medium and long term study into that, into what what, can, what the local employers required at this point. This is the point whereby this college in particular was in the Thames estuary. So that was one of the uh, free ports that was opening up. So therefore, it looked like there was going to be a massive increase in logistics, uh, shipping, storage, and uh, all of the surrounding skills around that. And the college itself was relatively well equipped for this, but not perfectly. So what we did was we applied that to their curriculum, strengthened up the curriculum that they had that would support that, added to that in areas that they didn't have support, and then worked out the technology which would be required, which was things like art artificially intelligent data analytics, uh, which is things that Milton Keynes College has taken on successfully, uh, and other things like, uh, Again, suits uh, virtual reality for for training for high risk environments, for training for working in storage, this kind of thing, and uh, and that worked really well. And the approach was plan for the short, medium, and long term of employment bring in the technology, bring in or create the hub which interacts constantly and directly with the local businesses so that you can then continually update or reallocate the, the hardware that you've got according to the changing and ever-changing needs of those local businesses. And by also creating these kind of open days and so forth, you're you're giving them knowledge of the art of the possible as well. So the business can say, oh my God, this has been a problem for us for ages and you've got a solution for it. We didn't know that. Now then what they're doing is they're interacting with the college. They're seeing that the college is ahead of the game in terms of technology. So that's who they go to for information in future. They know that the students are trained up in operating this technology and have a better understanding than they would because those are the people who demonstrated it to them. And therefore that increases the potential employment opportunities for those students. It increases the growth opportunities and uh, competitiv competitivity, if that's a word, of those businesses because they can access it, this technology and the skills to operate it ahead of time. And it creates a really good community network. Now, in terms of getting the information in and around this, again, colleges, that the one issue with colleges is that they tend to be time poor because it's it's a, it's more than a full-time job any aspect of working within colleges certainly in my experience so what's really good is that your local enterprise partnerships your local chambers of commerce and the people who the kind of public bodies whose job it is to actually do that research into local businesses will help they really were helpful in doing these studies before and they will provide a lot of background a lot of backing and information which will help to um help to start that process off. So that that would be my take on this one is it should be it should be seen almost as a as a market research, a market entry approach. And we should use that research, whether it be external, primary, internal, secondary, um, from these third parties who have a vested interest in helping with these kind of projects because it's, it ticks their boxes. It helps the college, it helps the employers, it helps the students. It's a it's a it's a quadruple win. So that's my take on it. Yeah, thank you so much, David. Uh, you can hear me? Yep. Good. <laughs> Give me a wave if you can't. Uh, not to be too um, uh, disruptive, but the market analysis bit, it does suffer a bit sometimes, doesn't it? And what do you think that's down to? Do you think it's just the rush for when this funding comes in and that that stage gets a little bit of lip service? Because it, it's so critical, isn't it? Yeah, gold gold standard would be do the research first before making the purchases. The reality is the funding comes in and it has to get spent the next day, so you don't really get that opportunity. So what's a good idea is to actually engage with these local enterprise partnerships and with the chambers on a fairly continuous basis so that it's just something that you're always aware of. And, and to be honest with you, the colleges tend to have good awareness of this, but there's these other layers. There's, there's people who are basically working purely on that in a full-time job. So it makes sense to leverage them and just have regular catch-ups with them. Say, okay, where's the skills gaps here? Where, where's the where's the areas that this, this, this location around about the college is weakest in or could do with support in? And, uh, and then from that, when the funding does come in and it's this last minute, right, we have to buy stuff, you can respond intelligently and quickly. Um, that, that would be my, my solution to that one. 
Yes, and, and but how much variation is this? I mean, is there just an incredible amount of technology that you could buy and navigating is very difficult? Or is there more of a sort of standard selection that you tend to recommend to colleges? Eh, no, either, that I, I would like to say that there's a standard selection, but the but because the technology changes all the time, what's um, fit for purpose one month may no longer be fit for purpose the next month. I mean, the example with the first college that I dealt with, they were they were uh, going to invest thousands of pounds per headset for virtual reality headsets with, with, with what we call outside in tracking. That's just little things that look like speakers that sit in the corner of the room and say where you are in the virtual world. And that was fit for purpose when they were recommended it one month prior to me arriving and then it was no longer fit for purpose because you can now get inside out tracking like the oculus quest headsets that you see in the market right now which are a few hundred pounds as opposed to a few thousand pounds and that was the difference of a month <laughs> so you really yeah, want, yeah. We, i mean we can see that as uh, where we where we worked with david in in scf1 and um we started those conversations with with amanda over as part of stf2 and we said do need to do some technology bits please do some technology bits and we're saying oh you know that's yes but we've evolved and we've moved on could we have something that's slightly different here um because we've been using it and so we've just got a bit of feedback that says if we did it slightly differently in this way then we think that we'll have an even greater impact so it's yeah it's a wonderful <laughs> ever-changing world um which is why we recognise that, you know, our, our request to make sure that things didn't become obsolete was wildly, like, enormous. Um, but when we had the list, and we had a really extensive list, didn't we, David, that first time around, we had to prioritise and identify the things that were going to have the biggest impact, because some of the things were so incredibly exciting. Um, you know, a forklift truck simulator, fantastic but so incredibly expensive, so incredibly expensive. And we just had to remove that from our work as we evolved and said, actually, instead of just ordering two drones, can we order five and we need them to be a better specification? And don't forget to get um, road, like your blade guards because actually that's really quite important <laughs> if they kind of accidentally fall. Um, so there are little things like that, that as we began to use the technology, even then we realised that we needed a little bit of extra here and a little bit of extra there. And it, you could only do that when you've used it. You know, and, that, and that's part of the learnings. It's always going to evolve. It's always going to change. And if we were doing the project now and getting the kit in, I don't know, when do we get it? Like February, something long lead times. Watch out for some of that. Um, we would probably be having a different conversation about some of the different kits. Yeah. So it's it's a really interesting one um, yeah. in that piece. There's, there's a lot to think about there, isn't there? And I suppose that's the role of uh, someone like David and his organisation is that you've got yeah. to think about not only how cool and useful is this kit, but how good is the support from that company? And, yeah. and, and even, you know, if it's a small company, are they really viable? You know, will they be around in six to six to sixty six I mean, months we we absolutely had that conversation at some point yeah. as well. large enterprise yeah. could mothball a particular product couldn't they so it's uh we've just found that they've stopped supporting a certain thing in one of the bits of kit haven't we and so we're like hang on a minute we've just literally kind of acquired that or there's another bit that's moving from one supplier to the next so we don't know whether we're going to continue to receive the same level of support and this is all within six seven months it's not to say that we shouldn't invest and bring this kit in we just have to be really clever about it and Kurt said at the very beginning bring in partners make use of expertise and that's what we've done that doesn't mean that we don't want to do it ourselves that doesn't mean that we haven't learned as well so we are much more capable of doing it more ourselves now and that's not to say that we weren't capable in the first place but by working with a partner a handful of partners we've been able to really kind of evolve and we will continue to evolve um, but Kurt I mean that equipment does have a shelf life no matter how long that is so to what extent do you have to kind of front load all your plans and try and make hay while the sun is shining and all this equipment that you have I mean, uh, for me, I've always been of that view and I've made many mistakes of buying the leading, very leading edge top quality kit 
and regretted it a little bit later because I don't, and, and that's the point I think I've learned that you don't have to get the top of the shelf because as we talked about, six months is a long time in technology and actually it halves or quarters the price or even, you know, 10% of the price very quickly. So, and, and that often the very top features of the best kit aren't really necessary because you're teaching the basics or you're teaching at a slightly lower level or whatever. So the very leading edge isn't exactly what you need. It's fit for purpose, it's demonstrational, it's only one uh, piece of that that you're, that you're delivering. You're not giving every single piece of expertise in that top product. So I've learned a lot from that over the many years, actually many mistakes of probably just investing a little bit too much in what I thought was the very leading edge and that way it would future-proof it a bit, but actually, that's not really, I think, really what happens. Um, you don't future proof because it moves too quickly. So actually stepping back a little bit from the quality edge or very leading edge um, is, is certainly what I'm looking for. Can't always do that. And I totally appreciate that. Uh, but that's my, my considerations always now, to be honest. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, David, right? Oh, I'm, I'm not muted. Good. Uh, yes, no, that does make a lot of sense. And, and actually, part of the part of the purchasing is to is to work more on the um, what is this for? What what is the purpose? Because the technology will change, but sometimes you find that the same technology, for for example, certain uh, types of virtual reality headsets are called three degrees of freedom. They only they only measure these kind of movements. Yeah, they're, they're they're not as advanced as the most recent ones, but they're a fraction of the price, and they're actually still fit for purpose for a vast amount of applications where actually physically walking around a room when you have the headset on isn't required. They are available, they've been around for years and the technology hasn't changed. So if that is the requirement, then why over-purchase and get something which is over-engineered for the purpose and may itself become obsolete when there's stuff which is gonna stay appropriate? So I think that connecting what's the right uh, hardware or software for the job and connecting that the, the hardware with the software and vice versa so that they work with each other can increase the longevity of the technology and reduce the overall cost. Also, that approach of, yeah, that's a lovely shiny device, but is it necessary? We were looking with uh, Amanda at uh, a device which is an omnidirectional treadmill, and those things cost 40,000 pounds each, plus about 20, 25,000 pounds just to ship them over, or you can get something which works in a completely different way that costs about, I don't know, a tenth of the price, um, you know, and, and it is local and has support and so forth. So you can save a lot of money by going, it's not about the tech, it's about what it's for, what will do it. Yeah, I mean, I saw that the Boston Dynamics dog was something like $80,000. And then you showed me similar ones on the market that use the open source source code that were $4,000. That's right. Knowing where to shop, isn't it? <laughs> and Amanda, you're living and breathing this, aren't you, at the moment? Yeah, I mean, the approach we've taken is that actually people are in at quite early stages with learning how to use this kit. So much as you might like to give someone a McLaren to learn to drive in, you're not going to, you're going to give them a Renault Clio or something like that. Um, and I think that's where we are. We want, we're going to flood the colleges with kit that we're working on with this SDF project so that it becomes kind of mainstream and normal. And I suppose the other thing is, um, it's a bit like when the iPhone first came out, everybody wanted one, but nobody knew what they were going to do with it. But it isn't about identifying what you're going to do with it beforehand, because you, the use of it changes over time. So we've just gone for the sort of generic stuff, really, but in large volumes so that we've got that flexibility um, so people can learn how to use it and then we can follow our noses after that. Our next briefing is in January, Amanda. How would you feel about coming to talk to us then about how it's all going? Well, that's if we've got any kit by then. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be good to tune in anyway at that point with you. Uh, Absolutely. In some form or other. Um, four minutes on the clock. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to keep this call open just a few minutes after this uh, in case anybody has uh, anything they want to discuss um, proactively right now, of course. But, but questions for those that have been speaking today? We could probably squeeze a question or two in. Um, it's fine if, if there aren't any at this immediate point because we are running the clock down. Uh, I want to say thank you very much to those who have been contributing today. So Kurt, Georgina and David were our invited guests today. Uh, thank you very, very much for spending some time talking through these challenges, opportunities and exciting areas. 
Uh, obviously, we've heard from others uh, who've had their cameras on, and Sue, I think, might have just jumped off, and Amanda, uh, which has been very helpful in terms of contributions. Um, I hope I hope this is useful. I hope this kind of debate, discourse, dialogue is is useful. Um, it is very much a changing world, David, isn't it? Oh yeah, <laughs> the most changing world of all the changing worlds. But it's really nice to see it being adopted and used with colleges and further education. It's uh, it's the right place for it. It helps to guide the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, the software developers. It helps to the, the local employers. It helps the colleges and it helps the students. It's the right fit for this emerging technology. Probably the best fit is education. Yeah. Uh, and David and I get far too excited about these kind of things. And we are absolutely passionate about the digital divide and making sure that students, lecturers, teachers, uh, companies, career, find, you know, finders, they, they do get the support they need. We, we think the FE colleges are a magnificent route into this, and it's pretty much our, our main focus. Um, and, you know, that's where we make ourselves available, really, from... Um, what do you call it? Bean to cup, David, isn't it? From right at the start of what, what do we need and when do we need it through to, you know, rooms full of people and students together learning and using that equipment and it getting the maximum value. So if you need those sort of things, then then great, you know, call me or call David. Uh, <laughs> I think most people have probably got my details, but the easiest <laughs> way to catch me is just team MKR. Dog. I, honestly, I mean, I will follow up with people that love to have these kind of conversations. I'm sure there's many others in the room who are having these debates and thoughts right now and um, we, we may be of some service to you um, in which case we'd love to speak um, we're at time my goodness well, no. started on time finished on time so uh, as I said I'll, I'll officially close the session now and just hang back in case there are any questions of a different nature that will be um, we, we can address thanks again David Kurt Georgina and everybody else um, most of all thank you for your fine company this afternoon and I wish you a successful rest of the afternoon Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Hi, David. I'm sticking on. I'm Graham Styles. Hang on. Let me just turn my video on. I was keeping very quiet in the background. <laughs> Hello. How are you doing, Graham? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. good. There we go. I don't know if my videos come on. I was. Um, yeah, it's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 I didn't want to intimidate you with my good looks, but I, I'm <laughs> glad that you held off. Uh, I, <laughs> I have the same problem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it's all very interesting. I was listening sort of with one ear. So I'm the interim IT manager at HCUC, so a college in West London. Um, often get people. I hear it an awful lot about dig digital transformation. Um, I... Graham, we've lost your audio. Is that just me? No, actually, it has just gone off for a second. Maybe uh, connection. Hang on, let me try again. How's that? That's better. Yeah, we can hear you now. Do you know what it is? Oh, it's gone again. Sorry, Dave. Sorry, Graham. Uh... Gone again. How's, how's that? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, it's whenever I get a Teams call come through, it kills my audio in um, uh, on Zoom. So there you are. So let me, let me talk on the computer rather than there. So yeah, so I often hear people talking about the subject matter you, you're discussing today, and I, it looked as though the audience was much more academic in its nature. Um, so obviously I, I joined it joined the call because I was I was interested in what you were saying, and it I feel as though people talk at me about this stuff, and I think. I feel as if I'm an enabler for the underlying technology. Um, but I don't know as if, uh, I don't want to wash out dirty, dirty laundry in public, but I don't know. I think people talk in the hope that somebody's going to drive something forward. Mm. We've got an IoT, so we've got an area of um, excellence in the college that we're keen to publish but or publicise, but we don't know the next steps. I often hear AI mentioned, and I could be wrong, somebody within the college on the academic side may be already pushing things forward. But I was particularly interested in you, David, when you, you were talking, what would be the next steps? And I appreciate some of that might be taking it offline to, mm -hmm. to understand a little bit about the services you offer and how you work with FE colleges. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> usually the next steps are to ha have a proper chat about who who are the, the main, or well, what is the main subjects in your curriculum? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the main needs that you're seeing from local employers? And if you don't know that, then we, you know, we can usually find or signpost the people that can provide that information. And then uh, we just start having a, a, a kind of an honest discussion about, okay, well, what would speed this up? I mean, I'll give you an example. There's a lot of... Um, requirement for things like welding skills because of the vast number of new wind turbines requiring to be made. And this is just in certain areas like the East Coast predominantly, right, and South mm. East Coast. Um, and uh, they're, what are the requirements? 10,000 welders per year for the next 10 years. There is absolutely no way that the colleges with their current welding training equipment can meet that demand. They just can't. And then you've got the cost the wrong of job. <laughs> I think we are. There's a lot of money in welding coming up. There really is. But yeah, but the problem with that is, of course, you need that kit, that equipment, you need the rooms, you need the fireproofing, you need the, and then the gas itself costs a fortune, particularly now, and all the metal that gets wasted. There's equipment out there that you can buy for, you know, a few thousand pounds, which will teach the first two thirds of the training using augmented reality welding units. No gas, no metal really good guidance and so by the time they get to the actual physical welding point they're already all the bad habits are ironed out of them and that process becomes very very quick and also from the pers personal perspective of the pre-existing welding trainers they don't get alienated by oh we're going to replace you with technology they're not no it's just making it more efficient and, and meaning actually more sustainable as well from what you just described it sounds like much more sustainable way of providing it so so yeah. i think what you're trying to tell me is, is what i suspected that the touch points are many in the college because that's that's our engineering department but we've got our employability team too and this is why i was saying whenever i hear it i always feel as if it's directed at it it probably isn't i mean i work hard to provide the infrastructure they can build these products on yeah. but I'm, i've certainly not been involved in those discussions and um, if they are going on beyond that about how can we do more interesting things and how can we bring ai in um, into the, into our college well, you know, it changes your it changes your role because remember there used to be like a computing department, and that yeah. was the only bit that had computers. But now we use computers for everything, right? But the IT and the computing department still are the ones that have the knowledge uh, of how to make these things work, how to implement them, how to get them working. But ideally, if you choose the right technology, it shouldn't and won't require your constant oversight and support. It should just be a okay. We'll help you through yeah. the you know the initial hard bits, <laughs> and then it'll be ready to go. Um, and yes, I, I totally agree because with the employability side of things, there's a lot of issues about soft skills and this kind of thing. And that we're using VR and AI for. To You stick on a headset, you get put into, a, I don't know, a, a job interview, and it picks up on your movements, your tone of voice, the words that you've used, and then swaps it around so you can see your performance. That is, is really good for employability, but it's not the kind of thing that you would naturally associate with the hardware technology of virtual reality. And yet it's probably one of the most popular things that we've got at the moment. But I would say it would expand your role to facilitating the technology in a much possibly broader range of disciplines and environments you would normally be using. But IT would still be useful, if not all the more useful. And, uh, and I think, and I don't want to hold too much more time. I see a few more people have stayed on, but I think, I think you'd probably find that the college would welcome that in terms of, I think that's what they desire. They've, they've probably not articulated it clearly enough mm. internally, but I, when I pick up on the messaging, I think what you just said there, that expen expansion of a role to, to, for IT to be more than just a facilitator. That, that was the purpose, Graham, of this. You know, we had Kurt, who's probably a visionary, and then we had Georgina on collaboration because they were the two things we really want to emphasize today. Yeah, and I, actually I know of Kurt. I've got a colleague that works. I know the... IT manager at Kurt's College, so that was another reason that I wanted to jump on the call. I wanted to hear, hear from him what he was doing rather than the IT manager. <laughs> <laughs> but he obviously approached it in a very different way to so talk around funding. And again, as an IT bod, that that's a world I don't really hear. I always hear that secondhand. Mm. And this seems to be my background's not education. It's, it's actually it's more along your lines, Dave. I've come from advertising and media background, so you know it's it's um, I have to learn a lot about the the, the language and the like I said, you talk about funding and frameworks and all the stuff that's second nature to educationists is all new to me. So, but you and know what? Great. 
Is having a media step? background is really good about communication and my background in marketing and, and, uh, and media and stuff like that has actually worked really well in education because it's the same logic. It's how to yeah. get messages across to people in a way that they can understand, you know. Actually, uh, David, I've just seen you stuck your email address in there. So what I'll do is I'll ping you an email directly so that uh, it might just be an initial chat. Could be the wrong person to be pushing for the college, but I'm yeah. definitely interested more in what, what, you's, what you've learned and what you've done out of the colleges. I'd love to speak more of that. That would be great, Graham. Yeah, all right. So listen, I'm going to mute. It's something I'm not very good at. And there's only way to do it is digitally. So I'll turn myself well, off. I was, I was and, uh, had one ear on yourselves. And then I had a, quite a lot of chat messages coming in that I was just trying to answer. So I hope I wasn't being distracted. But I was trying to multitask, which, of course, in <laughs> itself is not possible. Um, so Jer Jerry's obviously from the team here. So uh, he's, he's stayed back kindly, but probably uh, doesn't need to sort of raise his hand out. Martin, did you want to... Um, uh, say anything or chat about anything before we close the call. Uh, you might have dashed away and just left it on mute, of course, which is fine. No, I think, uh, yeah, I think we'll call it there. So um, if you if you guys want me to jump in the meeting with you, very happy to, don't need to, but certainly make myself available if I'm any use to that meeting. No, that'd be um, good. Dave, yeah, I'll, I'll Dave, dropping your message. Awesome. awesome. I'll follow awesome. up with everybody else and just get some feedback on that. It sounded like it was useful, had some nice messages at the end there. Um, yeah. so, Graham, your, your thoughts on these quarterly briefings? Invite people from the industry. You know, it's, the, it's, it's the first one I've joined. Of so, so, and again, you, you don't care about my life story too much. But, but I joined the college a couple of years ago, and I know everyone likes to talk up what they've done, and you, you know, make it big bullet points across a presentation. But we have been tearing the network apart from the ground up. So, wow. um, it doesn't mean so we put everything in you, but we've had to. You know, we're, we're doing some pretty cool stuff in terms of just shifting hardware into, into the cloud. We've re, re cable put new Wi-Fi 6 network in, CAT 6A cables across all four of our campuses. So we've increased Wi-Fi by about 400%. I've got about 800 access points across, inside and out. So this is all about, the, like I said, the building blocks. And the other thing, you know, having come from an advertising background, we all grew around with a MacBook in our hands. Uh, you, I came to the college and no one had a laptop. So I've got about half our staff on laptops, and that's about as far as my strategy is going at the moment. It's, it's you know, it's it's mobilising. I, I think you can't you can't think about the next steps until I've got a fluid workforce, and you've got to have the Wi-Fi. It's taken me eighteen months to put the Wi-Fi in. Mm -hmm. So so in terms of this, it's the first time I've really thought about the next steps. I've been so focused on consolidating servers and putting in new switches, the boring stuff. But without it, we don't have a, a reliable network. To, to think about the cool stuff. So it's a very long answer to say it's the first time that I've joined one of these sessions and thought about how do I start thinking beyond, mm. as, you, as you said, David, the IT manager, how do I look at what can we deliver? What, what, um, okay, what, is it what lays? I don't know. It's, it's what, what are the next steps? I'll provide the foundation, but what's next? Well, that's what I was going to say. You can't build a castle without foundation, and and the, you'd be amazed how many colleges and universities out there that I've attended, they they don't have those foundations. They don't have adequate infrastructure, and they're saying, "Oh, can you install a, you know, crazy technology?" And like, well, a is that really your priority when none of your students can get online? B, it wouldn't work anyway because you don't have the suitable infrastructure. So you've done it the right way around, you know? Yeah. Um, but you're right, sometimes it's good to then, once you've been immersed in that side of things, just, you know, kind of take a look around the kind of the art of the possible and go, okay, I've done that now. What's what's out there that I can, I can so, build on? To so give you an example, David, I've been talking to the people we, we put the Wi-Fi in and asking the things, because I hear AI mentioned all the time. But just from a simple, simple perspective, you know, what can we do next? Push notifications or open days. How can we, how can we do just, to, and, and even with an open day, can we, can we skim some information from people by offering them an AI experience and then understand more about what courses they're interested to, to help our marketing team. So all that stuff is in my mind. I've got the, I've got some ideas. I just don't have the hooks. I don't have the, what are the next stages? And I'm only, again, because of the advertising, I think all the, I'm like a magpie flying to a bright light. I want all the cool stuff. We forget about how much stuff we do in our engineering department, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. Areas, which areas of our college could benefit? And could we be surprised? You know, could it be travel and tourism? Could it, I don't know. Yeah. I don't, so, and I think that comes back to what you're saying, which is 
the touch points could be many in the college. Mm. Um, and my voice is an important one, but it might not be the most important one at the table. Mm. So you've got to think about funding. It could be employability, like you said, going to our local employers and finding out what it is you need. As you said, sometimes they don't know, do they? Yeah. But, well, this is it. And marketing, as you'll know, is a kind of a two-way communication street. But then there's also the whole, you have the badge that says, I understand IT, I understand technology, which gives them the confidence that you're the person to be talking to them about technology. And then it's, uh, but then it's the listening point of, well, what do you need? And then you talk about, like it was talked about earlier in the presentation, then it becomes about partnerships and people like mm -hmm. Richard and I, who just all we do all day, every day is, is vet and assess the new technology and see whether it's any good or not, whether it's ready, what it would be useful for, how we can get the best prices for people. The thing is that the OEMs, they, who manufacture this stuff, they've got a vested interest in making it as easy as possible and as cheap mm -hmm. as possible for the colleges to get their kit. And then, because you once are the very good at that, David, just, just where credit's due. I mean, not just the savings, but, but convincing them of the opportunities through the college network. You've done some really great work in that. Just to, <laughs> well, I mean, thanks. You're but too polite to say it, so I'll say it for you. <laughs> but it is—it's quite easy, really, because the the the, the benefits, you know, to, are absolutely stand to reason. Once you once you highlight them, mm -hmm. you basically what these guys are getting is a, is a an active free hub who has paid them or at least met the cost of them putting their technology into that hub and is now promoting it to a whole area of our country and will continue to this do This is our cunning plan to get them to pay, but we're not quite there yet. But not quite there yet. And that's, <laughs> these are the sort of areas that I don't understand. I don't understand the funding models that, that people were talking about. That's kind of, obviously, that's not going to touch IT, but it's it's that's important, right? Where's the money coming from? We've The, the college made significant investment in the, the boring bits, um, I've obviously had to win that argument, but they've also had to find the money and support that. But I think they've supported it because they know what's coming. They're doing it to think about the next step. And we can't, we just, you know, we, we, I think we get trapped in thinking, well, is it hybrid learning? Do we put some screens and some cam cameras in a room? But to be honest, I've only worked at one camera college before and I saw them go down that route what, 10, 12 years ago. And it was a, yeah, you know, it was a load of wasted money to be quite frank. Mm. You know, they thought they they assumed they knew what what they wanted to deliver, but they didn't think about the end game. They thought about the they almost start. You know, it's like you start with the iPad and you say, "What can we put on it?" Rather than, yeah. you know, here's this is the application. What do I need to deliver it? They 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 approach the problem the wrong way almost. They do so um, often because that's that's the you know the most obvious point of connection that they'll see is the technology. But, you know, we, we've had technology that we've recommended the same thing for medical, for education, for oil and gas. You know, the technology is largely speaking relevant. It's what it's capable of. And yet you see, for instance, schools buying thousands of iPads and then what they end up getting the students to do in the iPads, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a digital tablet. It may as well be a wax tablet because they're just sitting in a room with a teacher writing down the same stuff on a more expensive Whereas you have programming yeah. and using 3D scanning directly from their iPads linked to the camera and, you know, phenomenal, right? Actually, you know, also with, I mean, if I walked into engineering, they'll have 3D printers and they'll have all kinds of crazy stuff going on. But um, how do you normally approach engaging with a college? The fact that you're talking to the IT, Johnny, I'm guessing that's not your normal entry point into a college. It's usually going to come from somebody high up in curriculum. That's right. It's usually somebody who's largely speaking either in charge of the overall college or they have been put in charge of what the fuck are we going to do with this funding that we've just got, you know? And uh, for instance, uh, 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 Amanda, uh, was Amanda, sorry, I'm terrible with names, but the, the woman who's running the West Arts College thing, that was 10 colleges. She was suddenly thrust into, you're in charge of all the technology for this. And yes, she did have a technology background, but this is a massive undertaking that she yeah. just had to put in her shoulders. So she got in touch with us because we'd done the Milton Keynes thing and Georgina had recommended us. And uh, she said, okay, I need to get this sorted out for the funding. And I said, okay, well, when, when's the funding deadline? And she said, tomorrow. So me my, yeah, so me and my team had to basically stay up all night working out everything that we could get for them. And then a year later, they got the funding awarded and then it was all hands to the pump again. And we spent the last four weeks refining that list down, during which point we've saved them, I was saying to Richard this morning, two million pounds. Now, they only had a budget of 3.2 million pounds on the kit list. We managed to get that down by two million to make it fit. 
So, so I wonder whether or not my next steps, I'll just say, obviously I've made a note of your email address. I'm wondering whether the next step is actually an internal one where I've just got to nudge people outside and ask them what, what we, you know, have you had a discussion? What are your expectations? Are we just saying the words and hoping that somebody amongst us is going to pick something up? <laughs> you know, I mean, in house, Graham. You know, we could bring this kind of discussion, and, and you could invite your your leaders and colleagues, and you know, yeah. we could just provoke this discussion if you, if that was a good place to start. I think I, I think it may be. So I'm an interim IT manager, so yeah. I don't work directly for the college. So I'm used to treading. Not I wouldn't say carefully. I have to be respectful that I don't. If, if I was working directly for the college, whilst I've got a big mouth, I, people would listen to me. Actually, they listen to me more because I'm external. Mm. But I've just got to be respectful of their internal processes. They might not engage me in the same way. I tend to find my caution is always misplaced. So usually they're really happy that I'm doing something. I bang on about sustainability. I've become, uh, I, I'm like a woolly mammoth that's just been defrosted. I'm the last person you'd expect. I'm, I'm closer to being Nigel Farage than like some, some kind of eco warrior. And yet I'm the one banging on about sustainability and turning things off and, think about how you print but not saying don't print think differently about you know again again the marketing side of things you know it's usually you use the carrot not the stick you know mm. force people to do things you think creatively about how do you encourage a behavioral change and it's you know so as i say i just find it quite amusing that i seem i'm an old git and i seem to be um the one with the radical thinking at <laughs> Well, this is the thing, is that you're probably... Guys, I'm going to have to dash. Table. I've got to be across town. Yeah, no worries. Nice, nice to meet All you, Richard. Yeah. All the best, guys. No um, I don't know whether I 